Very welcome and thank you for joining us from uh, many European countries. We've seen on the registration that we have people joining in from all over Europe and beyond, um, people from business, industry, investors, academia, so a wide variety of, uh, of participants, which we're really happy about that. On behalf of myself, um, my, Rob Bauer, my co-host, whom you see on the screen as well, and Maastricht University, a very warm welcome. And also a special welcome to our speakers for today and our panelists. My name is Mika Olat, and I'm a professor of uh, comparative and national company law at Maastricht University. And co-host for today is Rob Bauer, and he's a professor of finance at the School of Business and Economics at Maastricht University as well. Before we get started on our program for today, I want to tell you a little, little bit about why we're here today and um, the background of the program and the ideas we had with composing this program for you today. Now, first of all, when it comes to what brings us here today, that's the memory of Mr. Peter Elhoving, a business leader who had a very strong focus on long-termism and um, ideas about how companies should be run. He sadly passed away and after his passing away, Maastricht University uh, decided to create a chair um, called the Elvading Chair, uh, dedicated to topics that were close to him, namely sustainable business, culture, and corporate regulation. Both Rob and I are appointed as co-chairs to this uh, Elvading Chair, and it is within the ambit of this chair that we, will, that we are organizing this event today. Now for the program of today, we've decided to focus on two topics. Um, first, the European Green Deal on the one end side, and on the other hand, the future of the modern corporation. And let me start explaining a little bit the background of, first of all, the second topic, the future of the modern corporation. We chose this topic um, because, well, first of all, it's the working title of a, a book and that uh, Professor John Kay is working on at the moment, and that he, we found him willing to talk about his ideas on how to what the future of the modern corporation is um, today. And we will discuss that in the second, in the first part of uh, our webinar uh, as a second presentation. Um, and of course, the question, what is the future of the modern corporation is something that is widely discussed um, at the moment. Questions like, what is the role of the corporation in society? How should they be run? Are questions that are high on the agenda of many business leaders, academics, as well as legislators and policy advisors. Think, for example, of back to December 2019, when the US Business Roundtable came with the statement that companies, US companies, should do more than only make money for their shareholders. But also the critical views that are now emerging that not much has happened or changed in practice since then. There's, of course, also the scholarly debate uh, on the corporate purpose. I think, for example, of uh, the program on the future of the corporation by Colin Meyer at Oxford University and the British Academy. And of course, this is not only an, Amer an Anglo-American discussion. Um, things are moving on the continent as well. If we look at France, for example, that recently introduced its WAP Pact, where they require companies to have regards to the consequences of their activities for the environment and for the society at large. And they also stimulate companies to voluntarily define their corporate purpose more clearly in their articles of association. And then of course, there's also the COVID crisis, um, which places the question of the, how the modern corporation should be run to the forefront. It makes the question even more pressing. It raises questions like, what is the role of sustainability and corporate social responsibility investments when the continuity of the business is at stake? There's also those who claim um, that uh, basically companies that have focused in the past more on corporate social responsibility are more resi resilient to unexpected shocks. Now, all of that is still subject to research and debates and are questions that we can touch upon today. And at the same time, there is a push from at least parts of business practice. Um, think of, for example, uh, in this respect, the Dutch Sustainable Growth Coalition, um, which is a group of Dutch businesses themselves who ask for sustainability to be the cornerstone of COVID-19 recovery measures at the national as well as at the European level. And that brings us with the second or 
actually the first topic of today, um, the European Green Deal and the role of the European policymaker um, in this respect, because companies obviously do not work in a vacuum. Um, and the European Green Deal, um, which was launched in December 2019, uh, is, and I quote, a new growth strategy that aims to transform the, the EU into a fair and prosperous society with a modern resource efficient and competitive economy. And the EU, EU aims to, to be climate neutral um, in 2050. Now, this is obviously a, a, something that where companies play an important role in achieving uh, these ambitions. We will start our discussion for today with the European Green Deal and with a presentation uh, firsthand by Mr. Dietrich Samson, who I will introduce to you shortly. After that, it will be immediately followed by an interview uh, with Professor John Kay. Um, and then we will move on to our panel discussion. A quick announcement to the audience in the meantime. Um, there is no room for questions in between the first presentation and the interview, but I can imagine that you would have questions for both um, Mr. Samson and Professor John Kay. Feel free to already place your questions in the Q&A session. If you look at our screen and the Zoom, and you go to the bottom, you will see that there's a chat function and there's a Q&A function. You can already, during the discussions, place questions in the Q&A uh, part of this webinar. We will try to address these questions in a panel session. And unfortunately, we will most probably not be able to deal with all questions, but we'll make a selection. When it comes to your questions, please make them clear. <clears throat> make clear to whom your question is addressed and keep it short. Then, still before we get started with the first speaker, a quick note on the composition of our panel. Um, we will ask the two speakers to also take part in our panel. And next to the two speakers, we have uh, three CEOs. I will also introduce them later on when we start the debate, but the quick note on the composition. We have um, Ms. Marlies van Weijen. She's the CEO of a family business in the painting industry, van Weijen Verre. Then we have Mr. Hein Schumacher, CEO of Friesland Campina, and we have Mr. Dimitri de Vrezen, co-CEO of DSM. Now, what these companies all have in common is that they, pay, that they place sustainability high on their agenda. They're also members of the Dutch Sustainable Growth Coalition. What makes the combination, in our opinion, uh, very interesting is that they are all three also very diverse, very diverse in their setup um, and their type of shareholding. Van Weijenverf is a family business, but also a benefit corporation, while the indirect shareholders of Friesland Campina are its suppliers, the farmers, and DSM is, of course, a listed company. So we are very much looking forward to hearing how they see the future of their corporation and of all corporations more in general. But before we get to that, let me first introduce you our first speaker. Um, the European Green Deal, it is a very hot topic. Uh, open to debate uh, in a lot of media. And we are very happy that today we can hear about it firsthand. Uh, the presenter of the European Green Deal will be Mr. Dirk uh, Samson. Um, he is, since November 2019, head of cabinet uh, for first vice president of the European Commission, Frans Timmermans. Um, he was chairman of the PvdA between 2012 and 2016. That's the Dutch Labour Party. And before the election um, to the House of Representatives, he was CEO of a green energy company and a campaigner uh, for Greenpeace Netherlands. We are very happy that you found time um, to share your views on the European Green Deal and to tell us something more about it, Mr. Samson. I would normally say the floor is yours, but in an online session, I don't have the feeling that we're sharing uh, much for, but let me tell you, say that uh, the megabytes are yours. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the invitation and good to be here in this digital environment. Um, yes, let me explain a little about the Green Deal. And then there, uh, to do that, I have to take you back to another era, which is pre-COVID. It's only nine months ago, but it seems like ages ago. We presented the Green Deal at the beginning of December 2019, right out of the gate in the first week of the new Commission's mandate to underline the new Commission's ambition. Um, and the Green Deal, when we presented it, was perceived, uh, unbiased obviously, but with, with, uh, with 
with some pride and, um, and joy. Um, and people thought this was different than normal. And it is. Let me explain you why this Green Deal is different from, let's say, normal environmental policies that the European Union has produced dozens of in the last decade. This Green Deal is different in four ways. First of all, maybe most important, it's ambition. For once, politicians didn't go for the feasible, the pragmatic, the lowest common denominator. Now, for once, we said we only settle for what's needed, um, dictated by science, dictated by our own environment. So, hence the, the ambition to become climate neutral before 2050, uh, a 55 percent target in 2030 for CO2, but also a zero pollution ambition for all other kinds of pollutants, and the ambition not to only to stop the diminishing of our biodiversity, but in actually increase it for instance, by planting 3 billion trees around Europe. Not only the ambition stood out, but also another aspect. Normally, policymakers concentrate on one aspect of the world. Uh, so they produce a policy on transport or on agriculture or on energy or on chemicals. And this time we did a different. We made a comprehensive plan for everything because everything is connected. Well. Now, more than ever, we do realize that in times of COVID. But uh, thinking about it, it's actually more than logic because there is only one ecosystem, one ecosystem in which everything is connected. And if we design a policy to preserve that ecosystem for the future, it should be a one comprehensive plan, hence the Green Deal. And the third difference touches upon the subject of today which is, it wasn't actually an environmental policy. It was a growth strategy. And I remember that vividly because I got some flack from the, let's say the old buddies from the NGOs, the environmental movement, because how on earth could you imagine presenting an environmental strategy and a growth strategy? The two are contradictory. Well, they're not. Uh, I'm convinced they're not. Uh, and if they are at the moment, we should change that. Europe needs a growth strategy, which is working our way towards a sustainable future. We are an aging continent in many ways, our people, our buildings, our industry, and we need more new momentum. And we did realize that before COVID, and we do realize that even more right now. And the fourth difference from a normal environmental policy is maybe the most important one, and certainly the most challenging one the justness of it. The Green Deal put a fair transition, one that takes everyone along, leaves no one behind, front and center in its policies. And for good reason, because we know from experience that every transition has um, what you call, could call a Darwinistic nature. It always tends to end up with more power and more money in the hands of fewer people. And the first transition, the industrial revolution is maybe the best or the worst example, so to speak. And the rise of social movements is the consequence of it. In order to repair the damage, the inequality that arose from that transition. And this time it should be different. This time we don't want to repair the damage afterwards, but we want to enshrine justness and fairness in the transition itself. And I can tell you that's the most challenging part of this. Well, so we presented that all in December with pride and joy and, we, and vigor and we wanted to get to work and we did. And in the first few months, we already presented the most important elements of the Green Deal, including a climate law that would enshrine the climate target in the law in order not to be distracted from something urgent that could somewhat suddenly happen in our life. And then something urgent happens suddenly in our lives. COVID-19 entered our world and turned that world upside down, completely upside down. And to be honest, uh, when that happened at the beginning of March, I despaired a little because I thought, here we go again. We've been there before. Huh? I can remember that 
in 2008, an ex-vice president and presidential hopeful in the United States, from the United States, walked into Europe, bringing along his movie, an inconvenient truth, and he mesmerized Europe, its citizens, but also its politicians. And I remember editorials from Tony Blair and Jan Peter Balkenende at the time, urging their fellow government leaders in Europe to take action to take on this incredible danger and to fight climate change head on with ambitious policies. And they were designed, almost implemented. And then Lehman Brothers fell and turned the world into the financial and later economic and euro crisis. And we haven't heard about an inconvenient truth anymore. But this time appeared to be different. So my despair was not needed because this time Actually, the COVID-19 crash that the economy is going, uh, going into, and we're still in, in the midst of it, didn't push the Green Deal off the table. No, it increased the attention to the Green Deal. What we managed to do in the last half a year since COVID-19 entered our lives and changed our lives completely is to design the recovery strategy to recover from the corona crash as the Green Deal grows plan. Actually, we already had it on the table. So there it is. Actually, that is not that evident as is shown by the past. Normally, a society would be distracted by an urgent matter and would concentrate on that urgent matter and would forgive, forget about the long-term policies. I think that's what companies have uh, to deal with all the time too. Uh, companies, societies, politicians, we're all the same human beings, aren't we? Quickly distracted by something urgent, forgetting about the long term. This time different, why? Not sure, we are in the midst of it, obviously, but there's three good reasons that I can see why this time is different and we didn't dump the Green Deal in order to fight an urgent cause. I think it's because the crisis itself is much more fundamental. A bankruptcy of Lehman Brothers and a falling financial system was something that was wrong in society, but our society wasn't wrong. We, we were still on the right pathway, weren't we? So, but this time the COVID crisis is felt more existential. It shows us how vulnerable we are and that we need more resilience and that we are actually part of an ecosystem that can fight back in one way or another. It's not for nothing that uh, in many cartoons and other uh, pictures, the COVID crisis is only the first small wave and then the climate crisis is much bigger, which comes afterward. It does focus us, the COVID crisis focuses our, our attention towards what can happen next, climate change. That, that's one reason not to forget about the long-term target. And that's one of the reasons why we managed to put the Green Deal front and center in the recovery package. I think the second very important difference is technology. If you look at the, the status of our technology, our sustainable technology right now, and you compare that at when, with 12 years ago when Al Gore had to deal with it, it's a difference between night and day. Offshore wind in 2008 when Al Gore walked into Europe was five times as expensive as normal electricity from gas or coal-fired power stations or nuclear. And so five times more expensive. If you would power, for instance, a country like the Netherlands with that renewable energy source, it will cost the European or the, the Dutch taxpayer about 100 billion a year. 100 billion a year, one sixth of our GDP. That's unimaginable. 12 years on, fast forward to right now, offshore wind energy is cheaper than gas-fired power. It's just as cheap as coal-fired power, much cheaper than nuclear at the moment. That's a mind-boggling development that changes our world. And um, it didn't happen overnight. We did it ourselves. We invested in a long-term plan to make renewable energy, in this case, offshore wind much cheaper than it was and it was successful human beings can do 
incredible things. And the same happened, obviously, with solar panels. This time we have to give, give the credit to the Chinese because we were too short-sighted to invest in that heavenly in order to make it cheaper. The Chinese did and accomplished the same result. And now we profit from it all, uh, all over the world. And the third technology that I want to take as an example, because it's so exemplary, is electrical vehicles. 12 years ago, the electrical car was a deplorable figure. Uh, you could drive with it to the end of the, of the street and then it was empty and you had to look for a socket to charge it again. And it costed about a, a, a fortune. Now electrical cars become on the market for normal people at normal prices and actually driving them is cheaper than driving a gasoline car. And that changed all in 12 years time. And that's incredible. And it makes it easier for us to focus the, on the long term because we have the technology and especially through these technologies, we have the optimism that we can create new ones. But we need companies for that to do that. Huh? And the third difference between 12 years ago or 20 years ago when this happened before and right now, that's our children. And I hadn't imagined that that would such, be such a huge factor, but I, I have experienced it firsthand in the last six months or nine months that I work in the European Commission right now. Every conversation I have with people that deem themselves very important, and sometimes they are, politicians, leaders, heads of state and government, CEOs, civil servants on a high level in member states, all of them somewhere in the conversation, bring up their own children. Because their own children are asking pertinent questions to their parents. Hey dad, what are you actually doing to save the future? What's your company doing? What's the work actually that you're doing there every day? Are you looking at our future? Climate change, biodiversity, nature, oceans, forests. And why are we eating meat? And why are you flying all over the world to go on holiday? Can't we go a bit closer? Every Friday there are on the streets, the Friday for Future Movement. But more important, every day they are on, on our own kitchen table asking those questions. And I can uh, tell firsthand that bad news article in a paper makes a, makes a politician feel bad. But not half as bad or not a, a tenth as bad as having um, at not having an answer to your own children. And I guess the same is for CEOs. Angry shareholders, that's a bad day for a CEO. But children that ask questions that you cannot answer, that's existential. So I think we are better off and better equipped than ever to make this happen. But now we need to make it happen. This green deal is on paper. It's put into uh, our recovery plan. We commit, because we don't have it yet, we commit a truckload of money to it, public money, 750 billion euros in the next five years, added to the 1 trillion euros that we already committed to the next seven years. That money now needs to be spent. And there's obviously public entities that deem themselves very capable of spending it. But we can't do it without company. We can't do it without companies with a long-term vision that have the same agenda and the same ambition as the rest of society has right now. Politicians are just a translation of the rest of society. And rest assured that also within our own policies, we're going to try and do everything to nudge or squeeze or even force companies to do the right thing. But from experience, I know that companies, if you force them to do the right thing, they will do, this, do it as long as you force them. And as soon as you look away, it's gone. What we actually need to happen is that companies enshrine the long-term objectives in their business cases. And again, we can do something to help. We can subsidize, we can incentivize, we can turn policies in the right direction. But it comes down to the people in the boardroom and on the floor of a company to make that change. So that's my plea to you today. Don't think that you can wait for policies 
that will drop onto your desk and make you change your, your company and your direction. No, you have to intrinsically do it yourself. And it's going much far, faster than you think. Look at the solar panels, look at offshore wind, look at electrical cars. The developments have taken on in a mind boggling speed and that will continue for the next 10 and 20 years. Don't think this will, uh, this will blow over. Don't think you can just sit back and relax and wait for developments to happen and then join the, the bandwagon at the last possible moment. The bandwagon will be gone by then. And rightly so, because we are in a hurry. We've only three decades left to save this planet. We have only three decades left to be able to answer to our children. Thank you very much. And I'm looking forward to a nice discussion. Thank you, Diederik, for this uh, really well introduction to the EU Green Deal, but also explaining why the time is right for change. Uh, I guess we will definitely come back to this in the, in the panel discussion later on. But first, we have an interview with Professor John Kay. So if Professor Kay, please put on the video and Diederik put out the video. We can go to the next stage. While Professor Kay is starting the video, I will already introduce him for a bit. Hello. So we're really happy that you're here. Uh, to join us to talk about uh, exactly a topic that is connected to the EU Green Deal, the future of the modern corporation, which essentially is the working title of, uh, of your book that you're writing. Uh, Professor Kay, to introduce him, is a well-known British economist and academic. He actually was the first dean of the Oxford State Business School and has also other academic affiliations. But he's also a prolific writer. So you may have heard of his recent book, Greed is Dead, or the book before, probably uh, not so long before that book, Radical Uncertainty, actually discussing many of the topics that we are discussing today, uh, but then way before it happened. Uh, but he also chaired the K report, uh, or wrote a K report in the UK. So he has a high profile uh, in, the, in the United Kingdom as well, and was deemed by the Financial Times an inconvenient critic to many key policymakers in economics and finance. And I predict that his thoughts in his new book on how we should run 21st century companies might also be deemed inconvenient by some lawmakers, uh, boards and management of companies, uh, consultants, academics, uh, active in the domain of corporate law, uh, management of finance. So let's see here why. Let's hear why in the next 20 minutes. Professor Kay, I'm fortunate enough actually to, to be able to have some insight in your evolving manuscript and you start in this manuscript with a quote from the Bible from Mark. Uh, I, I'll try to read it because it's English from, from a different century, but nonetheless, and no man putteth new wine into old bottles, else the new wine doth burst the bottles and the wine is spilled and the bottles will be marked but new wine must be put into new bottles. Obviously, I see the analogy. Why do we actually need fundamental change in how we actually govern and run our companies in the 21st century? Can you give us some background? Yeah, we need fundamental change in the way we understand corporations and the way we think about corporations. If I go back into the last century and all the literature that was developed about corporations uh, then, it's almost as if there was only one corporation in the world, and that was General Motors. Peter Drucker wrote the first business book ever to be a bestseller, which was called The Concept of the Corporation, and it was about General Motors. And Alfred Chandler founded the subject of business history. He wrote basically about two companies, DuPont and General Motors. For Ronald Coase got the Nobel Prize for starting uh, for his initiating seminal article on the theory of the firm was produced following a visit to Detroit, which of course the largest firm was General Motors. When Ralph Nader began in the 1960s, the critique of modern business, unsafe and with unsafe at any speed, it was General Motors who was taking a tilt at. But we're not in Detroit anymore and General Motors does not describe typical modern business. The theories I've just been describing started with the idea that a firm is described by some kind of production function, a combination of capital and labor, you write it down as F, K, L. You can substitute capital for labor 
And if you increase both capital and labor, you increase output. And of course, that led one to the kind of Marxian analysis of the tensions between capital and labor. But that kind of production function doesn't even begin to describe Apple or Microsoft or Amazon. Home was also a collection of assets. The General Motors was characterized by its car plant and the machinery that was in it. But I can't talk about these kind of businesses uh, in this way anymore. If I look at Amazon or Apple, I discover literally that these companies do not own anything at all except the cash on their balance sheet. Uh, they have very little capital in, engaged in the business at all, and that capital is not owned by them. When you pass an Amazon warehouse, it may say Amazon on the side, but it doesn't actually belong to Amazon. And finally, the firm was, and this was development of the Cosian framework, a nexus of contracts. The firm was described by legal scholars as legal fiction for a set of agreements between individuals, shareholders, suppliers, customers, investors, and so on. To say none of this begins to describe a typical 21st century firm. Corporate personality is not a legal fiction as people described it last century. Corporate personality is a reality. A firm is not defined by its, its capabilities, uh, by, its, uh, by its assets, it's defined by its capabilities. And together these capabilities constitute what we can describe as collective intelligence, a problem solving capability. And that's what modern firms of the type we're describing actually have. It's a problem solving capability that goes on from one product or service to the next product or service. It's nothing like the repetitive manufacturing process that characterized General Motors and the the plant and the people who worked in it. So when you when you describe in your book uh, the history of the firm, you say that in the past century, since the industrial revolutions, these firms have created a lot of comfort and prosperity for a lot of people in the world. And in the most recent three decades, it has raised more than a million billion people from extreme poverty. And you also add then that people even trust their employer more than they trust government. Uh, although only U.S. Congress is less trusted than the big businesses in, in the U.S. And interestingly, these same Americans regard small businesses as highly trustworthy. And what stroke, strikes me in what you just said is that you, the examples that you raised were the Apples and the Googles and the Amazons. But probably there is also a big role for the small businesses in all of this, and especially in Europe. So can you... Does this imply that we probably have to also think about the size of businesses and how we run these businesses? What is your view on that? Uh, we do. And the businesses we're describing, including uh, the Apples and the Microsofts, Amazon's a bit more complicated because Amazon employs a lot of people on rather routine tasks in warehouses. And it's perhaps a decade before these tasks are actually done by, by robots rather than individuals. So that's a changing world too. So we have a key to what I'm describing is to say that businesses in the modern world are today based on structures of relationships. It's much more difficult to have these structures of relationships that are stable and enduring in large businesses than in, in small. And another thing about the, the businesses I've been describing, even the apples and even the Amazons of the world, is that they employ many, many fewer people than General Motors ever did. So in this sense, businesses have shrunk in employment, even if they haven't shrunk in market capitalization. Also important, I think, is that the equity markets we've been accustomed to are, I believe, another 20th century phenomenon. The public listed company with actively traded shares, that was, archetypally General Motors. Of course, General Motors went bust when the public traded, publicly traded uh, shares become, became essentially valueless. But actually, once one realizes that modern business doesn't need capital to buy assets, to build car plants anymore, to the extent that modern business needs capital to cover the operating losses of early stage businesses, 
And again, if I'm talking about these modern businesses, that is the purpose and the only purpose for which they raised businesses, um, they raised capital. Apple, Amazon, Microsoft haven't raised any capital from public equity markets for a couple of decades now, and they're never likely to in future. Okay, so uh, we will definitely come back to this in, in, in the panel, for instance, also is the B Corporation and maybe an answer to the diagnosis that you give, but we don't have the time for that right now. We go to a different question, because in your book, you already mentioned collective intelligence. You mentioned other concepts such, such as radical uncertainty, communicative rationality, discipline, pluralism, way too much to explain in an interview. But you also give a lot of weight to the term <coughs> creating hierarchy that sort of recognizes the organization chart, but it's also one in which information and authority flow up as well as down, in which decisions are ratified rather than imposed. So for the ordinary organization now listening to this, to this interview, what will change if there is a mediating hierarchy? What are the concrete differences given what we have now? I think about all the uh, features of the modern business you were describing, Rob, the collective intelligence uh, and the like, is that they're all based on relationships between individuals. And that's central to understanding the modern corporation. Now that's very different from a world in which there's a, a boss at the top who gives orders to smaller bosses who give orders to people below them. The kind of traditional hierarchical organization that was, well, it, it originated really with military organization. And then it was adapted for 19th century businesses like railroads, and then for 20th century businesses like car plants and General Motors. What I mean by the mediating hierarchy is how you have to run these people businesses. It's a phrase that comes from the American legal scholars, um, Lynn Stout and Margaret Blair. And I found it very instructive. It says that when people join these kind of organizations, what they're doing is signing up to this mediating hierarchy. All businesses need some kind of decision-making structure. You need, uh, you need decisions to be made and you know, need to know what they are uh, when they have been made. But they're made by a process of collective intelligence and they're ratified by the hierarchy and the people towards the top rather than being implemented from the top down in the traditional mechanism for these 19th and 20th century type businesses I was talking about. Yes, and, and how will that then, so if you if you have more, ex, let's say, mediating hierarchy companies and these other concepts are also transferred into the, into the firm's behavior, how will it shape the governance of this modern corporation? Will that have an impact on how we govern? Um, I think it does. I think what we need to be doing is understanding that uh, business is a professional activity. It, ought to, it is and ought to be like um, medicine and teaching and soldiering and the priesthood and all these kind of things that have their own structures, their own rules and the like. And what I would like to see would be accountability becoming itself a professional activity. That is management, the business of management has to have its own ethics and values and practices in the way in which other professions do. But we also need to develop a part of that profession, uh, which is about controlling these businesses. And I can see three aspects of that that exist at the moment. There's the role of the non-executive director, there's the role of the auditor and accounting function, um, and there's um, um, the, the, three point, the, the audit and accounting, the non-executive director and the asset manager. And what we need to do is create the capability in all three groups here to be able to hold management to account and to have effective governance. So I believe that businesses need to be run by professional managers, but these professional managers need to be effectively accountable for what they do. And this is the the structure and systems which we need to develop in order to do that properly. 
Yeah, so you you address these these three important parties in this discussion, and you mentioned asset managers. Let's say talking about publicly listed corporations, they are held by a dispersed group of institutional asset owners, let's say, uh, and asset managers. There's a big difference in my view. I mean, the end owners, let's say, the pension funds or the beneficiaries of the pension funds is a different category than BlackRock, Vanguard, etc. But they all have different tastes, preferences, and also beliefs about the future of the corporation. I mean, if you just look at legal and social and cultural differences between the US and Europe, Still, all these investors, owners, own these companies also in Europe. So how does that, uh, maybe, uh, is that a barrier for the reshaping of the modern corporation uh, and, and being able to challenge, uh, to, yeah, to, to organize all of this and the challenges around? That issue of ownership later. But I think what I'd like to emphasize here is that it's about accountability. I think companies are best run by professional managers. They're not well run or probably run at all by as it were groups of shareholders or other or beneficiaries or other investors i think we need chains of intermediation but our chains of intermediation are far too long at the moment i think the role of asset managers is not to tell professional managers company managers what to do is to hold them accountable for what it is they do now, if asset managers are doing their job well, then they will mostly be enthusiastic about the companies in which they hold stakes. Uh, that's why they're holding stakes in these companies. So it's their job, first of all, to make that external assessment of the quality of the company's activities and the quality of its strategies and trust professional managers to do it. And if either they're getting the strategy wrong or they turn out to be the wrong people to implement these strategies effectively. Then at that point, it's going to be the job of these, uh, uh, the accountability profession, as I would like to call it, to, as it were, effect change, either to require professional managers of the companies to effect change, or in the last resort, to change the managers themselves. But that's the way I see it. It's not having boards of companies that are, are representative of, um, uh, of the various stakeholders. It's actually having professional managers balance the interests of the various stakeholders and accountability mechanisms to make sure they're doing that job properly. That's how I see the future of governance structures. It's a, it's a great discussion point for later on, especially in the context of Dutch companies, I guess. Um, you just heard uh, Diederik Samson speak about the EU Green Deal, which is a challenge next to some other challenges that are approaching companies. Is there any sort of personal reaction to how companies should respond to this before we go into the panel? You have a view on that? I think personal, all right, one personal reaction is to say that uh, what we've been talking about in the, at the moment didn't have a very large role in it for external regulation. What I believe, and this goes back to the accountability, professionalism and accountability, professional accountability mechanisms, is that we will succeed only if the values as a society we want to impose on companies are actually internalized by the companies themselves. That's what we need to achieve. It's not achieved by, um, by external regulation. And as part of the work I've been doing, which you've been describing, Rob, I've been looking particularly, I, or I wrote an earlier book about financial services, about financial services and pharmaceutical industries, which are, I think, examples of industries that have become very heavily regulated. And over the long run, I think the aggregate of effect of regulation has been to make things worse rather than to make the things better. Because what you've done by regulation is essentially to legitimize any behavior that falls within the scope of regulation. Mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, and that means people push at the limits of regulation. And in both these industries, actually found ways of, in effect, circumventing or minimizing the impact of the regulatory objectives. What we need to be try to do, and this is the way I would approach the thinking about the Green Deal or anything of that kind, is we need to ensure that these values are properly internalized by companies themselves. 
thrown at probably even starts with HR policy, uh, but that is definitely something we will come back to in the panel later on. Uh, I think for now we, we, we stop the interview. We uh, ask all the other uh, participants uh, of the panel to start the videos. And I will turn over to, uh, to Mieke, but of course, first I thank uh, John for your interview and your, your answers to my questions. Uh, Mieke, you take over. Yes, yes, I will. Thank you very much. Um, thanks for the insights as well um, from uh, Dr. Samson and Professor Kay. We will now start um, our debate and I will first introduce to you uh, the people who have uh, come in on your screen. Um, our CEOs, we have, first of all, Ms. Marlies van Meijen. Um, she started her career at uh, DSM, actually, in 1989 already. And she joined uh, later on in 1994, uh, the family business van Meijen Berf uh, in Zwolle. And that's a, a fourth uh, generation uh, company uh, and the third largest decorative paint producer in the Netherlands. And uh, innovation and sustainability are very important pillars um, for the of the company, which she will uh, tell us a little bit more about uh, in a minute. Um, then we have Hein Schumacher has joined us. He's a CEO, uh, Chief Executive Officer of Royal uh, Friesland Campino um, since uh, January 2018. Um, before that, he held the position of Chief Financial Officer at Friesland Campino. And prior to joining Friesland Campino, he was, held several international uh, positions as uh, international companies such as Unilever, uh, Royal Aholt, and what is now called Heinz Kraft. And then we have uh, Dimitri de Vreze. Dimitri de Vreze is a co-chief executive officer and chief operating officer and member of the management board of uh, Royal DSM. Um, he was appointed as co-CEO uh, in uh, February 2020. Um, and he joined DSM uh, already in 1990 in the finance in DSM's fine chemicals. Very nice that you all could join. We're very much looking forward to your views on what we've heard uh, today. And my first question basically goes out to, to, to all three of you, but I want to start uh, with Dimitri de Vreze first. Um, when we think of the future of the modern corporation um, and what we've just heard, um, what are then, in your opinion, the most pressing challenges that would affect the way you run, in your case, a public listed company? Um, could you tell us a little bit about, let's say, the two main challenges that you would see? Yeah, thank you, Mika, and, and great to be here. <clears throat> and I hope people are not counting back when I started in, in DSM in 1990, what my real age is. But apart from <laughs> your question, um, I, I, think it, I think it's interesting to see that, um, obviously, one of my mentors in DSM was Peter Elvedi. Um, that's also why, we, why we're here, right? It's, it's linked under his umbrella. And um, he basically started with developing a company, uh, a philosophy about what the purpose is of a company around stakeholder management, people, profit. And if you would ask me today, um, what is the key challenge? It's still that challenge. And therefore, I think uh, it's spot on that John Kay is here and here Rick Samson, because we try to to bring these stakeholders together in a such environment, which means that you're not only there as manager, as co-CEO to take care of the shareholders, but also about your employees, about your customers, about your suppliers and, and society at large. And what is, what is the key challenge is that today you are, apart from having a vision and a purpose for the company, you also need to shape it. You need to inspire people. You need to be an ambassador, sometimes a liaison officer. Sometimes you need to be convincing. Sometimes you need to be listening. So it's this complexity of, of running a company, which compared to the past is far more complex than ever before. But that also makes it far more rewarding and far more fun, I have to say. Because at the end of the day, um, it's this collective intelligence, what, what John was talking about. It is easier said than done because you need to partner up with different players in the value chain and bringing them all together and sticking to your dream for the type of company you want to develop for the future, I think is the key challenge for us. A, because you have short-term interests versus long-term interests on every stakeholder group. Uh, for employees, want something different than shareholders. So you need to find 
an inspirational way to bring these partners together. Secondly, we live in a world where there's full transparency, where we also would like to differentiate and do something completely new. But in a world where there's full transparency, that makes it also very difficult. And last but not least, you need to reinvest in capability. Um, capability is the name of the game. And we feel that if you have capability, you also have responsibility to help creating a better world. Not just make profit, but also think about your people and about the planet. In that perspective, I'm also very happy to see Melissa here because in all fairness, as a listed company, we could learn quite a bit from family-owned companies because they have this mixture, I think more or less ingrained in the family culture for the company. So we as DSM, we also look at family companies and how they organize. Okay, thank you very much. And that builds a bridge perfectly to uh, the next person I wanted to ask us. That's uh, Marlise indeed, Marlise Van Weyen. How is that for you? Because in, in family businesses, it might be a different ball game, as Dimitri already said. Could you tell us a little bit about that? I, I also saw that one of the questions of the audience was what about smaller businesses? And um, you have a, a large business, but perhaps you would have any, some ideas as well about what smaller businesses do. Um, yeah, yes, we of course um, uh, are uh, part of the family business uh, uh, group. First of all, maybe it's nice to uh, talk a little bit about what is the family business? Um, well, actually, it's a normal company like everyone else uh, or a normal organization. We have some um, extra uh, and different features. Um, we are known for our long term focus. Um, continuity is extremely important in our, our businesses. Uh, a lot of people often say we think in generations and not in quarters like a lot of uh, corporates. Um, and because family businesses go across generations, they are, in a way, we think, sustainable by nature. Otherwise, they would not have survived. Um, and uh, I think family businesses are very entrepreneurial and they have a large resistivity, um, what we also saw during the crisis in 2009. So um, I think when I, 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 I get these... Um, uh, uh, um, uh, it, um, description of a family business. Uh, Dimitri maybe can check the boxes where he uh, might learn something from us, but this is the way we look at the family businesses. Um, when I go to my own company, we are okay, middle-sized company, um, and um, middle-sized companies uh, uh, and, mi and family businesses tend to be very innovative. Um, but my biggest challenge is to how to turn my company into a sustainable company with, a, of course, a good future. Um, and then I already heard other, others say it as well. We need the support of all the employees because I can't do it alone. I can have an ambition, but I need everybody in on this job. Um, and for me, being sustainable is not an option. It, it, it must be the future of a company because if you're not sustainable as a company, I don't think you will survive uh, at all which means that I have to focus on uh, my products with we, who ha uh, that have to be very sustainable, which means I need innovation. And that is what you already said in the introduction key for, uh, for our company, um, to be able to deal with all the changes that, uh, that will be there in the near future. Um, yeah, and, and the, the, the other challenge for family business is we like to finance our own things. Uh, we don't want to go to banks, uh, some of the other uh, <laughs> things we don't like. Uh, so I have to finance this innovation um, and this change, um, uh, which could lead to a little bit of help uh, uh, from the EU, for instance, uh, to do that into the future. Um, there is a lot of uh, legislation coming up, uh, change in legislation, national level and European level which uh, cost also a lot of time and energy of my organization. Um, so that is also one of the challenges that will make my company different in 10 years than what it is now. Um, uh, and another challenge is of course the succession. I'm a family business. I'd like to have uh, the fifth generation as well. Um, there might be a fifth generation there, but I really hope we can have a successful transition, transition in generations in maybe somewhere in the next 10 years. Okay, thank you, thank you very much. Um, so I hear stakeholders are very important, and making the switch is, is requires time, effort, um, and 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 money.
talking about stakeholders, um, Mr. Schumacher, also for you, that same question. And I think for you, it's also even a, a more different ball game since your, your stakeholders directly have an important say um, in the company as well. Yeah, thanks, Mika. I was laughing a bit when um, when John was explaining uh, about the modern corporation. I was I was just thinking a little bit about it. We are a company that next next year we will exist for 150 years. And 150 years ago, a group of of, of nine farmers came together uh, somewhere in the Netherlands, and they decided that it was better for them not to go individually with a bit of milk from their cow to the market but to establish a company that would do that for them, but that they would still remain a shareholder ultimately in that, in that company. And the question is, you know, when I was reflecting, is that a modern corporation? And I think the answer actually is yes. You know, when, when it comes to holding management to account, well, my shareholders are not just a little bit committed or in there for a bit, but they are, I would say, involved. When 100% of your income eventually is derived from the company, but the company is also necessary to be there for your children and grandchildren who ultimately will take over your farm, uh, then it becomes a whole different uh, dynamic. And I think they are looking at us, at me, as professional management that they are certainly holding to account. Um, you know, it was actually funny when I became CEO one of my shareholders stood up and said, a CEO for me is just like a cow. Everything goes well if you just deliver the milk. When that stops, they tend to go to a slaughterhouse. I think it's sort of the ultimate way of holding people to account probably. But then you talk about uh, challenges. When you talk about challenges, I would say there's a few. Um, I would call out two. You know, the, the first one, is that um, the, the society is changing, of course, very quickly. I mean, clearly on environment, uh, which we talked about, which Diederik talked about, uh, green deals come along, consumer preferences are changing, um, and, things are, and, and things are changing fast. And as a company, you want to deploy a growth strategy to that, and you want to actually be at the forefront. But if you have all these stakeholders and shareholders who, uh, who need to transition with you, and particularly in the food chain, these people cannot change overnight. So the, the change is happening in society. Um, it's difficult to translate that at the same speed, for example, in a food company, and then to the primary source, which is where the farmer sits. They need longer term goals to make investments, and they, they, their payback times are simply longer. And that brings me to the second challenge, which is money. You know, if you, um, in, in my case, if we, if we, up our game and if we uh, impose more demands and requirements on farmers, which are also my shareholders, um, their first request back to me is that's that's a great idea, uh, but I cannot be green whilst having red numbers. And that means that I need somehow, some way, I need to provide them in the right income, a good income to make these investments that are so necessary to, for us to pursue our strategy to become and present ourselves, of course, as a very sustainable company providing sustainable food solutions. So that is a very careful balance that I need to constantly strike. You want to move on and you want to be ahead of the game, certainly when it comes to the sustainability question and to, you know, for example, making the green deal work. But on the other hand, um, I need to make sure that those who are so vital in, 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 yeah, in helping us and in supporting us to get there that they have actually a very good living. And that means that ultimately our consumers and our customers need to be prepared to pay a price uh, for those products that you establish in the market uh, for that reason. And you know that's not an easy thing always to, uh, to accomplish. I would say those are the two, the two, the two big ones. So time, um, money involved, and striking the balance uh, between the long and the short term, uh, particularly for my, uh, my shareholders and my stakeholders. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Rob, I think I'm going to give it now to you before I ask the follow-up questions. Okay, good. So we we um, also heard, of course, Diederik Samson explain the new EU Green Deal. And I first have a few questions for uh, for the CEOs, and then I would just like to have a reaction uh, of Diederik Samson on the answers. 
So my question to the CEOs are, what does the EU Green Deal mean for you and how can you contribute as a corporation? But at the same time, what do you expect from Europe to help you to do that? Uh, and that's beyond subsidies, uh, just to remind you. Uh, and what do you expect from other stakeholders of your company? And you can tell me which stakeholders you think are important here. So let me start with uh, Malice. No, that's a lot of questions. Uh... Let's start with the first one. What does it mean for you yeah. and what, 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 how can you contribute as a corporation? Yeah. Um, well, I, I, I had a little bit the feeling that uh, when Diederik uh, was talking about uh, the Green Deal, which he was very passionate about. Uh, let, let me start with that. I think that's good. There is a plan. Um, um, so that's the most important thing. And then we can take it from there and see what happens in, in the future. But I have the, had the idea that um, he thinks that uh, companies are waiting for uh, pressure before they act. There will probably companies that do that, but there are a lot of companies, believe me, Diederik, that really want to act now and, and make sure that everything will go right into the future. Um, I think that the Green Deal is, um, in my opinion, still a little bit too much focused on energy and climate. I think there should be more focus on uh, biodiversity, which is, uh, in my uh, opinion, even more important because we all want to stay alive. Um, and what for me is important uh, to help this Green Deal is to uh, proceed in transforming my company into this sustainable company that I have in my head. Uh, our ambition is to be, our ambition eh, is to be climate neutral in, in 2025. Um, we have working groups uh, right now at our company. Um, we are measuring all our carbon footprint on the product since 2016. And 2019 will be our reference year for that. Um, being a B Corp, it was already mentioned by Mika uh, in the beginning, helps us making progress in our sustainability goals. Um, it makes you aware. It, it helps also my management team to, stay, to take steps. But don't forget that family businesses in general have also a very nice uh, way of helping to make this Green Deal happen. I am uh, the chair of FBNet, which is the Family Business Netherlands. Family Business Netherlands is a part of FBN International, Family Business Network International. Um, this is a, a global movement from, uh, from China to America, from Scandinavia to uh, the Southern Hemisphere. And we all work together on a so-called Polaris project. And the Polaris project is already there for almost 10 years to, uh, to make steps with family businesses in sustainability. And even recently, uh, they started a cooperation with the UN on how to integrate the sustainable goals in your business uh, uh, and to measure the progress. And I'm very proud that we are one of these pilot companies. There are three pilot companies, but we are one of them. Um, and we, we even developed a hashtag for future generations. Um, the companies uh, in, the FB, in the network uh, have signed a pledge to uh, promote a purpose-driven business model and to contribute to a sustainable development. So I think the family businesses in the world, not even not only Europe, can do uh, a large uh, amount of, uh, of uh, things to help to make the Green Deal and everything that is attached to make a success. Okay. Well, I'll come back to, another, to the other question, uh, maybe in a second yeah. round in the, in the panel. Hein, I was quite intrigued by your comparison between a CEO and a cow. And because we are two uh, moderators, I had the time to check how long a milk cow actually lives. And it's at least five to six years. And if they're really treated well, it's at least 10 years. That's way more than a CEO is actually staying at a firm, at least in the Anglo-Saxon uh, uh, countries. There's, there's, so, good, there's good news for all of us on a Friday afternoon. That's yes. great. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> just, just to mention that. Okay, what does the EU Green Deal mean for you? Uh, how yeah, does... I, I would echo a little bit what uh, Malice is saying. I mean, first of all, um, and also Diederik for your uh, for your presentation and your in your. I mean, we're very happy in, in, and actually very supportive. I think it's a fantastic, fantastic deed from uh, from Europe. Um, um, I think we needed to make that that uh, that jump. Um, and and you know the goals, your goals, so to say, are are also our goals from a, from a company perspective. And as a company, we had them, I would say, prior to the new deal being published. So as Marlies is saying, I think as companies, we can be a driving force, um, not just the family businesses, but I would say many, and we do that in different forms and cooperation, but at the same time, therefore we're also supportive. So that's a good thing. I think it's also, as you say, it's, it's fairly comprehensive. 
Um, and I think, uh, you know, lots of support. I have a few comments uh, that I want to make, just uh, very brief. I think it's crucial that we don't confuse in the Green Deal uh, means and, and an end. So the means and, and a goal. Uh, if your goal is uh, to become carbon neutral, for example, um, or to have a goal on biodiversity, at least as you say, the question is if you need to be so prescriptive on measures such, I mean, if I read the Green Deal, it, for example, it talks very specifically about uh, a decrease of 20% in fertilizer. I'm going to my own uh, industry, so the food industry. Um, I wonder, is it 20%, why not 50 or why not 60? I mean, is, it, is that so important or shouldn't we focus on the end goal alone? The same goes for 25% um, of agricultural land to be uh, available for organic farming. Well, that's nice, but is that, is that by definition serving the goals that you ultimately have in mind? Or is that, is that just a means that countries or corporations or sectors should actually choose on how to get there themselves? And 30% of land being available for nature. Uh, the question is if that should be a nation state or a sectoral goal in itself, when you actually look at Europe as one ecosystem, whereby you should acknowledge that, I'm sure you do, that some countries are more there for agriculture, some more for production, some have ports, other stones. So the question is, are we sometimes, and that's, a, that's an open question, are we sometimes confusing, let's say, the measures and the means with the beautiful ends and the goals that the Green Deal certainly uh, has in mind and, and which we are absolutely supportive to? That would be my first response. Just, just keep your answer before we answer. We first go to Dimitri, and then maybe just like you did in politics, you can answer all these questions at the same time in, in a round. And there's also room for an intervention. Dimitri, what is, what is your view? Yeah, so you got three questions, right? But let me stick to the first two first. So let me start with, with what is the Green Deal for us? So first of all, we feel the Green Deal is courageous, it's bold, and it's the right thing to do. Um, and we are part of that deal. So I didn't, I mean, feel that we are included in that Green Deal because we think it's the right thing to do. That, that is the starting point. Secondly, linked to what John said, um, I think we represent three companies where we have huge capabilities as a company in, in our different fields of where we operate in. And therefore, we also have responsibility to add to a Green Deal which creates a brighter world. So. That is something where I would, I would start with. Um, so you can also ask support from us um, because we have the responsibility to work accordingly. However, I would also like to take the opportunity to go to your second question, Rob, um, after I mark the first one, because it's very easy for us as companies saying, this is what we need from the EU, right? Mm -hmm. I think it's a two-way street. It's a partnership. And by the way, not only between private and public, but also universities. Um, so for the EU, I would like to, to challenge a little bit, if I may, Rob. And of course, of course. Bit, right? I think sometimes, building on what Hein was saying, we make it far too complex. And I know that we as a leader sometimes need to simplify things. And I would challenge that we sometimes make it too complex. Because what we have in today's world is a system that works. It's an economic system. It's not ideal, it is not 100% correct, but it's a, it's a great system where we buy things, where we add value, where we sell. And the problem of that system is that there is waste. There are failures in that system and that waste and failure needs to get a price. For example, CO2 emissions. For example, 95% of all carpets produced are being landfilled at almost zero costs. That should stop. If we put a price on waste, we don't need to develop a new system. We need to develop a price on waste, which recognizes innovation, which creates opportunities for entrepreneurs out there to use the system in itself and therefore help the system to correct itself. And that is not by putting a lot of legislation in. It's not by putting more rules on it not by saying we need to push companies. No, I would say set the sandbox 
and then ask the companies to play within that sandbox to create a sustainable future. That is how I see the Green Deal, and I'm part of that. We are partners of that, but in that sandbox. Um, let me stop there because otherwise I'm, I'm, I'm continuing. But it's an important point. We don't need to change the system. We need to tweak the system, and therefore the system works for us. Yeah, to some extent, there's a classic discussion on the role of regulation is emerging here. Uh, but let me let me give Diederik Samson the, the opportunity to answer both the, the, the questions raised by the CEOs. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, well, there's a few things standing out. Indeed, let me take the, the classical discussion about regulation head on. Um, because Marlies rightly said that we actually need to pay more attention to biodiversity as one of the goals, the ends. Um, and uh, it's clear from the Green Deal, and it's actually clear for our complete environmental policy, a key as we have it right now, that we are much more advanced in, in energy and climate regulation than we are in biodiversity regulation. We have a whole ETS system lined up. Uh, we, we struggled with it for 10 years before it, we got it working. Uh, so it's, things take time. Um, and, and you can see that with the uh, biodiversity regulation, which is pretty uh, rough uh, or uh, at, at a starting point. And that's exactly the, the, the criticism from Hank, uh, where he addresses a few of those regulations that are meant to preserve biodiversity, to stop uh, overnight, to stop um, uh, too much fertilizer uh, is to try and save biodiversity, uh, increasing the amount of uh, um, bio um, uh, agriculture. Um, is to try and increase biodiversity and to set a standard for 30 percent uh, reserved land for nature is to increase biodiversity. There might be much more intelligent systems, but we don't have we have them uh, we don't have them at the moment, and we have to start working on preserving biodiversity. All those intelligent systems where we just said, okay, we need to try and stop the diminishing the destruction of biodiversity haven't worked so far. So yes, we crossed the Rubicon uh, with the uh, European Commission and said, okay, if we can't do it in an intelligent way, we need to do it. So then we have only the blunt way um, uh, open. And I, I think we will be uh, pursuing that for a while until there's more intelligent systems to, do, to treat biodiversity as we did with climate, with very intelligent regulation. Um, but I also have, I mean, a few of you obviously challenged by me, said, yes, we are, we are working ourselves. We don't need the government to tell us that sustainability is an, uh, an important part of our uh, company strategy. Still, we need to do more. Uh, I think we need to move, do more. Um, I think companies need to be challenged, incentivized, or as I said, forced to, to create uh, to jump further into the abyss, <laughs> into uh, the uncertain future where you don't know whether you will earn that money. Let me combine two of your companies, basically, DSM and uh, uh, Formai. Um, one of the biggest challenges in Europe is the, the fact that 200 million buildings in our continent are poorly insulated, very poorly insulated. Our biggest energy waste is in our own homes and buildings. We need insulation. And so far, we are stuck with pretty old fashioned stuff. Uh, it's rock wall, um, and there's some variations of it, but there's not much better than that. You have those panels that, uh, that, you can, that are thinner than rock wall, but it's incredibly complicated to put them into a house. Why don't we have paint that has the same insulation factor as nine centimeters of rock wall? It is possible with aerogel paint. It is a possible chemical that you can apply on a wall and then we make our, our lives a, a, a lot easier and our homes are more, much, much more energy efficient and more comfortable. But to develop that is a huge challenge. It's a, it's a jump into the uncertain. It's actually what Elon Musk did when he started a car company, which nobody had done before for the last 60 years Nobody had started a successful car company apart from some countries, state owners. But private car companies were not successful for 60 It's too difficult. He 
he jumped into that uncertain future and here we are. And the same should happen with other innovations. So I, I keep on challenging everyone, also ourselves, because what I talked about our regulation is, is the same question. And we need to innovate also there. We need to be um, able, capable, bold enough to jump into an uncertain future. The same goes for companies. And if we do not speed up that challenge, if we do not speed up that innovation, we will not make it in the next three decades. Okay, so Mika, I turn over to you. Thank you uh, for this. I think we will definitely come back to that in the second round, but uh, we, we would like to sort of into, uh, integrate the audience into the questions for the panel. And Mika is gonna do a first attempt there. Yeah, I have a, a question for Professor John Kay. Um, and a question that is, is, is a bit of a mix of, of several people uh, in the audience in, in the Q&A. Um, I saw that, uh, for example, Heinz Schroeder, Ms. Martins and uh, Mr. Berghuis also uh, directed a bit in, in a question that I'm trying to make a combination out of it. We talked about um, making values intrinsic to companies, huh? making sure that there are intrinsic values and that companies also take these values on board. And you also talked about the role of, of, of legislation and that uh, basically perhaps legislation is not such a great idea. Um, the question is, if not by regulation, um, then how can we ensure that companies internalize societal and environmental considerations? Um, and another follow-up question was also, what is the role of the state? The role of the state seems to be coming in more strongly. Um, how do you see that uh, for the future? You have to unmute yourself, John. They're very closely related questions. Um, I expressed my skepticism about uh, how much we can do by regulation. Let me try and illustrate why. I talk particularly about two industries, financial services, pharmaceuticals. I'll pick one example from each. The reason we got credit default swaps, which were essentially the instrument which were at the heart of the 2008 crisis, is because we constructed regulations that was sufficiently different for insurance companies and banks that if you could uh, create a mix of a banking product with an insurance product, you needed to provide much less regulatory capital uh, than if you left it as a banking product. In the pharmaceutical industry, for example, we give companies fairly extended patents on new drugs. That means we have a huge activity which absorbs a large part of the pharmacology research budget of what's described as molecular manipulation. It's finding compounds that are effectively the same as compounds that already exist uh, but are chemically sufficiently different that they can be patented separately. So I'm very conscious of the limits of what can be achieved by regulation and of the extent to which if we adopt what one might describe as the Friedman Doctrine, which is companies should try to maximize their profits within the scope of some kind of regulatory framework, then we lend ourselves open to this kind of activity. And we've had it in the last 50 years on a very large scale. And in the two industries I've been describing, that has proved very damaging. We need to learn these lessons and that, for me, is saying it is about changing business culture, not about uh, imposing still more complex regulations. And that's why I've emphasized, on the one hand, that this kind of Friedman doctrine, we have to, uh, that firms, it's okay if firms do whatever they like, so long as it's permitted by regulation. It's not okay for firms to do what they like so long as it's permitted by regulation. And what we need to do is find the, uh, is make business in this sense, like ordinary life, where there's a lot of laws governing us, but we don't find ourselves very inhibited by these laws in the, our everyday life. Because what these laws are doing is they're enforcing on everyone what most decent people would want to do anyway. How do we change that culture? Well, it's quite a big job. 
I mean, I make no illusions about that. But that's because um, we've spent really 50 years, more than 50 years, moving in the opposite direction. We've created a cult of shareholder value. Uh, we've uh, allowed, we've created the idea that managers will do the only right, only do the right thing, if not just their company, but they individually are paying. I want to return to a world in which I remember once I um, had a retired chief executive of a large British company talk to a class of mine at London Business School. And at the end of it, he said, you know, these kids today, they regard being chief executive as a responsibility, as a prize rather than a responsibility. He was describing the change which has occurred in the 70s, 80s, 90s. It's a change which we need to reverse. But the mere fact that we changed business culture in this negative direction, it should be a reminder that we can also change it in a, a positive direction. And that's what we all need to be doing. Okay, thank, thank you very much. Um, quick reaction perhaps from, from um, um, Mr. Schumacher, you, you, you refer to um, the fact that you need your, your stakeholders on board and that it's not always easy to have them on the same page. You already referred also to consumers um, being part of that whole this debate as well. Do you need, would you, would you be backed up by regulation? Would that be helpful uh, in that respect? Could that be a driving force for you? Mm, I think that um, as we talked before, and I think what Dimitri was um, talking about, what I was talking about when it came to the Green Deal, um, you know, I, th I tend to believe that uh, pushing ambitious goals and holding indeed management, professional management to account to obtain those um, whilst, whilst um, pushing also for the right culture and the right codes in which to operate, I think is probably the way to go. I'd be careful indeed with, 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 a, with a huge and a complex framework on regulation. Um, I think that is, um, I think, you know, you, you actually destruct um, a, a certain amount of creativity on the one hand, and you are promoting um, uh, opportunities for people to escape the, regu the, the, the regulation somehow. So I think it has a, almost a double negative, a double negative effect. So yeah, I, 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 um, I think I agree with his statement in general. Um, and again, um, that doesn't mean that the, that the government or the role of the government is not important. No, they, they are important, uh, but more, in, more in, in, in setting ambitious and the right, the right goals. Companies will eventually figure it out. Again, within a framework of, yeah, within a, ask companies to apply the right code of principles and, 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 and make sure and hold them to account on that also. That's what I would favor. One quick uh, follow-up question for um, Marlies van Weyen. Um, when we're talking about legislation, there's also a whole academic debate on companies should have very clear corporate purpose and regulating the fact that companies should have a clear corporate purpose. Now, Van Weyen is a company that chose itself to have a, a, a corporate purpose uh, and also to be a benefit corporation. Huh? That's a voluntary choice. So in that way, it's, it's how it goes for all these companies, but for you also, uh, you, you voluntarily chose to make that much more uh, explicit. Um, do you see any changes in that sense when we talk about getting your stakeholders on board because of making that more explicit, perhaps? Your microphone is still on mute, sorry. <laughs> if you see the general uh, opinion of, of, of the world or the people in the world, they're looking more and more to uh, companies, I think, that have a purpose. Um, for us, uh, it was important because we think that we have to do the right thing to survive also. Uh, and we want to be a part of um, uh, a better world in the future. It, it, it sounds a little bit yeah, cloudy maybe, but th this is the way we look at it. Um, it, it is our future and uh, we need to make uh, sure that that future holds. 
Um, the B Corporation uh, was was actually an idea. A friend of mine phoned me up and he said, uh, hey, we just became B Corp, something for you, because I'm sure your company is ready for it. And I had no clue what it was, never heard of it. Um, but uh, uh, okay, I was I was triggered and I, I, I looked it up uh, on the internet and I said, we'll, we'll take a shot. Um, and it, it, it helped us to, um, to make, make further steps. It is a, a management system which helps you to become a more uh, sustainable company. And it helps you to think uh, uh, of subjects you maybe forgot in, in, in doing the things you do every day. So um, I don't like legislation at all. Uh, I, I, I know legislation, is, is there because it is needed sometimes, but uh, there is a lot of legislation that has no, no purpose at all. So um, as an entrepreneur and, and we try to stay away from that, we'd like to do what we think is, is right, but um, we do need a legislation on, on certain things and we do need help, I think, from, from governments. Because uh, as Dimitri already uh, mentioned on waste, there is a strange thing going on. I, I want to make my products more sustainable. That means I have to go to bio-based uh, raw materials, but they are more expensive. Um, and the problem is the, the customer doesn't pay more for a sustainable product. So there is problem number one. Uh, another uh, problem is uh, we make our uh, paint buckets from recycled post-consumer recyclate, um, which is completely 100% used plastics. Because the oil price is so low at the moment, the virgin material, the virgin plastic to make buckets is much more cheaper. So a lot of producers of using uh, uh, plastics go to the virgin uh, plastic uh, uh, raw materials instead of the recycled ones because it is cheaper. And there we need the help of, uh, of the governments, European-wide and nation, uh, in, the, in the Netherlands itself. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Rob, um, our panel is not in favor of too much legislation and as a lawyer that paints a grim future for me. So I'm gonna hand the questions over to you for now. <laughs> that, that fits perfectly well. I have a few questions in the audience to Diederik Sams on the EU Green Deal. And I also would like to ask um, uh, Dimitri de Vrees to give his perspective on his climate leadership uh, now initiative that, he, that DSM is also part of because it's related. So uh, Diederik, uh, so one of the uh, people asked, when we talk about the Green Deal as a growth strategy, could you elaborate more on the mechanisms of how the growth is to be achieved? And where do you see in society most resistance to this, to this Green Deal? That's one. And second, there is a question related to this, also very positive on the fact that it is a growth strategy, but also taking into account that some people are probably going to be hit because of the innovations. Uh, you know, certain industries will probably cease to exist, etc. How do you deal with that? And how do you manage that at the European level? Yeah, um, thanks for those questions. Uh, the first one is almost existential in the way that um, I've been an anti-growther myself uh, for a while, thinking that you couldn't uh, save the planet uh, with economic growth. Um, but I started to realize that Every one of us, every morning, gets out of bed wanting to do a little better than yesterday. We want to teach our kids a little more. We want to perform at our, at our jobs a little better than yesterday. We want to learn a little more. And 7 billion people doing that every day, that's growth. Uh, that's increasing our capacity, uh, so to speak. And a wise economist once told me that growth doesn't have a speed. Uh, it, has, it does have a speed, but it does also have a direction. And while you shouldn't try and um, turn the speed button up and down, you should, as a government, as a society, uh, willingly, knowingly, uh, choose a direction. And that's what we did with the Green Deal. So a growth strategy, but not just for the, for the, for the sake of growth, but uh, turning ourselves, our continent, and hopefully the rest of the world too, into a specific direction growing towards a sustainable future. Um, that's, and where you, where you see the most resistance is actually connected with the second part of your other question, where you say hey, there's a lot of people that might lose out on this transition. Well, that's where the resistance is, and for good reasons. Uh, if you are a minor and your father is a, was a minor, your grandfather was a minor, and your grand-grandfather was a minor, it's 
pretty hard to swallow that all of a sudden <laughs> you're told that your profession is polluting the planet and should stop. Um, no matter how, how much rationale there is for such a conclusion, it's hard. Uh, and especially when uh, you, there's everyone around you is also a miner, so there's not much diversification in the economy. And we have whole regions in Europe that look like this, Silesia, Krakow, uh, North Macedonia. Uh, there's, there's whole regions that are dependent on a few economic activities, most of them dealing with fossil fuels. So we need to change that. And what, what I said in my introduction is, normally we would just go through the transition and then see what the damage is and try to repair it. Now we want to do it up front. So we have increased or we have established a just transition fund and a just transition mechanism and all kinds of regulations, although we don't like it, but it's sometimes needed uh, in order to lift, especially those areas with a, which have a bigger challenge than the rest of us to lift them into the new future. And that requires investments in skills. It requires investments in new companies, diversification of the economy. It's a huge task. Look at the Netherlands itself. I mean, 50 years ago, we talked to DSM here, eh? 50 years ago, almost, or around 50 years ago, we shut the mines. And Heerlen was the fifth richest city in the, in the Netherlands when the mines were open. And now it's at the bottom of the pack. Uh, and that's 50 years later. So in 50 years time, we didn't close the gap. And that's almost the richest part of Europe. So. Um, I'm not underestimating the challenge there, not for nothing. I said that te te uh, technology, finance, it's all difficult, but it's there. The social challenge is by far the biggest one. Okay, thank you. This is a perfect transition to DSM, Dutch State Mines, for those who don't know, in the past. And my grandfather actually was a miner, so I can relate to all of what you just said. Dimitri, so... Um, you, you were very active uh, as DSM uh, in this field already for a while, but you also issued something called Climate Leadership Now. I think you were involved in that. Can you say something about that? What, what, is it, what is it driven by? Is it just companies? Are there other organizations involved? And what do you want to achieve? Yeah, thanks for that question, Rob. And, and, and I also take the opportunity to bridge it a little bit to legislation, because I want to nuance the picture a little bit that we are against legislation. We are not. I mean, let's put it that frank. So I think there are pieces of the world where we act together, where legislation needs to be put in place because they basically need to be corrected. But I think that's 25% of the story. So I think the Green Deal is not only legislation and part of the legislation we even support. It is a growth story. But growth story you don't make via legislation alone. So it's end and The growth story has to be linked to the purpose companies have. And I think Diederik explained it very well. It does mean that some companies will lose out. If they not go along with that transition, I mean, that's the name of the game. And that is why Marlies, Hein, and myself are running companies with a vision for the future, because we'd like our companies to still exist in 50 years from now. Well, so far we've done pretty well. I thought that we were old as DSM, but I now understood from Hein, he's even older. You also see it on screen. So you basically see that, that age is an important issue. But apart from that, going back to the climate action now, that is linked to that because there are a few issues on climate action. One is you could wait for legislation to come into play. That will be very reactive and that will only, people will only do that we see, if they see that as a threat. We see it as an, an opportunity, but also to echo the word John Kerry said, also as a responsibility. We as DSM, we have capabilities in terms of transformation, in terms of innovation, in terms of thinking about sustainability, and therefore we have a responsibility to help people in the value chain, to help partners to create climate action, to create a company for the future. And that is what we've done. So we basically think about three steps in that responsibility. One is we need to look at ourselves. So we need to reduce greenhouse gas emissions ourselves, right? We need to beef up the renewable energy we purchase. Uh, that is our own responsibility. The second responsibility is that we need to enable our customers 
our value chain where we play to be more aware on climate and to come with solutions where we reduce the climate impact that we call enable. And then the third piece is that if you have that responsibility, you also need to speak up. You need to advocate for change. And that is what we've done with Climate Action Now, where we look at ourselves, where we help customers along the value chain to, to basically develop products which reduce the climate impact, but also take leadership in advocating and take people along. And these things come together, and that's basically what you've seen on your, it's almost like a pamphlet, right? I mean, it looks a little bit like activist, that's not the case. Uh, in the digital world, this is basically being shared on the internet, but it's a call on everybody in the value chain to think about climate action and what you can do yourself, but also what you can do to help others in the value chain. Probably the group of uh, companies and organizations that are involved in this are, let's say, those that are really in favor of this and uh, at, the, at the forefront of everything. But some of the people in the audience say, well, some of the speakers appear to have great faith in the self-regulatory abilities of corporations. But there are many studies that show that progress is too slow on many environmental and social accounts. I had a debate uh, in, in February with my students and all, lots of students from the fossil free uh, movement in, uh, in Maastricht. Uh, and they told ABP, actually the pension fund investing for the university employees to stop investing in oil companies immediately, just to show what millennials are thinking. So they don't have this faith that self-regulation will work. So to those speakers, this particular uh, person wants to ask, are you happy with the progress that has been achieved thus far on a global level? So I don't know who wants to answer this. It goes back to what John said on the intrinsic motivation. Maybe one of you wants to respond to that. I'll, I'll respond briefly and say, no, of course I'm not happy. No. Uh, but I'm not naive about what we can achieve by regulation. And you talk about uh, students pressing the pension fund to divest from fossil fuel companies. If I thought a single gram of CO2 less was emitted into the environment as a result of that action. I would be impressed by the activity of the students, but I don't believe that, so I'm not. And you have to get much more serious and um, uh, dealing with companies through engagement, not through um, what well, we now call virtue signaling in effect. No. That was, of course, a discussion in that debate also. Uh, who else would like to say something about the state of the world we're in in this progress? I mean, it's the EU Green Deal is one thing, but of course, you have to look at this globally. I, I can comment a little bit on that one. Uh, I, I, I don't think it's going fast enough as well. So I agree on that and I agree with, uh, with John. Uh, but I also think, and I'm not against legislation. Eh? That's not what I said. I, I, don't, I don't like too much legislation. Um, but um, I think the governments themselves can also give uh, the good example. And um, it happens still a lot of times that uh, when I wanna, uh, wanna do business with governmental institutions, they don't go for the sustainable way. Um, and then it is very hard for a company to, to keep on uh, uh, developing and innovating your products. So I think also there should be a bigger mind change in the governments themselves. Okay. Yeah, um, I think um, we need to be careful not to echo each other, but I think, uh, I think, I think absolutely the same. Um, I mean, legislation can hugely, hugely help, uh, but it's indeed part of the, the story. For me, the bigger goals out there and let businesses figure them out are, are probably more important and accompanied by an active government policy. One example is on, for example, plastic and plastic packaging. I mean, if you look at that throughout Europe, I think most of the companies that I speak to, or we as a company, of course, companies want to move very fast because it's a commercial uh, differentiator on recyclable packaging, for example. There's no doubt about it, but that's not the point. The point here is in recycling systems. The point here is in collection of the, of the, of the, of the bottles, et cetera, et cetera. And for that, you, you, you need an active government policy because you can't, you can't do that as a company alone. So it needs to go hand in hand. If you establish strong goals, absolutely fine. Uh, but let's make sure that you know you do things in an integral way, and that it's accompanied by a good policy to facilitate reaching those goals. 
Okay. May, I, may I close of course. off? Go ahead. Go ahead. Because in this, this call, we basically discussed what governments should do, what companies should do, but we missed one critical element. And that is called consumers, which, by the way, all the students in the call are also consumers and they also have responsibility. Because the consumers basically should no longer accept that products are produced without a recyclable linear replacing value chain. They should not accept that mobile devices are being sold where there are still toxic hazardous materials. So as a consumer, we have also responsibility in addition to governments and in addition to companies. In that sense, it's a sort of a, a cooperation between all the elements and it should come together. So I would also plead, I think on a fair question and a fair doubt to the consumers, including the students and the new generation to no longer accept that products will be on the market which doesn't have a sustainable profile or that you just stop buying these products or are willing to pay more for products which do uh, look at recycling or sustainability. And, and that is one key area where we really strongly advocate. And then you will see that also corporations will see opportunities. And then it's no longer legislative being pushed, but it's an opportunity and we transition into a better world driven by consumer behavior. Yeah. One build, I completely agree. One build that uh, EU, and I'm not sure, Diederik, if what, what, how you feel about that, but how the EU and governments can help is by making that point of origin and the how things are done to make that very transparent. To make it very transparent. I think that is, a, that is very, very critical because only then, as a consumer, you can actually make that decision when you purchase. A response, Diederik, or we go to the next? Yeah. Yeah, just very short. We have launched in, in the context of the Green Deal again uh, the so called sustainable products policy, where indeed we are going to do two things. We're going to prescribe how products should be made, and we're going to tell the public how they are made. Um, that runs into huge complex uh, difficulties because um, to also show you. Well, that are still, let's say, an old-fashioned dynamic between regulators and companies. As soon as we start talking about regulating a certain product, let's take, well, what, what, uh, on my table, uh, an, a smartphone. If we start regulating smartphones so that they, they are repairable, reusable, and do not contain toxic materials, the building that I'm working in is stormed by the biggest companies on Earth uh, lobbying their way out of that regulation. Uh, so, but while they might have a very long-term future, they also have very short-term interests. So, in a way, we are in a new era, but some things do not really change. And uh, if I may, one remark about students and what they can do. I fully agree with John that posting Facebook messages is not changing the world or reducing CO2. But I do see something happening which makes me very optimistic, which is the fact that companies like Shell and others have difficulty finding new recruits from the student world. And that bothers them more than having difficulty selling oil. They know that they will sell that product somewhere. But if they cannot find new talent, which Shell thrived on in the last 100 years, they have a real problem. And when I graduated, Delft uh, <coughs> Technical University of, of the group of 21 students that I graduated in, five went to work for McKinsey and the rest went, went to work for Shell. And one so one soul for Greenpeace. But so and that completely completely changed because the students nowadays ask the company that they that they approach, they say, okay, what's your story for the future? Yes, we like a good contract and a nice pay, and obviously everybody's a human being, but they put much more interest in the future uh, and of the, the purpose of that company. And Shell doesn't have a very good story to tell them. And that is also a changing dynamic that makes me very optimistic. Okay. Over to Mika. Yes, thanks. Um, um, a quick question on, on um, basically the role of the CEO, but also embedding these, these, these values into um, the company themselves. Um, 
we already talked a little bit about, and Dimitri, you started with that, um, about uh, Peter Elverding, uh, his idea on, on stakeholders being important and being also important um, to you in, in, in how the, the company is run uh, in, in the future. Um, we had a question uh, in the Q&A also saying, well, you can have somebody who is a CEO who is very much in favor of sustainability, but how can you make sure that either you resist shareholder pressure or that if the CEO is changed, that um, you have that same emphasis on what uh, the sustainability that you've already started and, and the way you've already approached it. How do we make sure that also over future generations of, of business leaders, um, what is important to the company remains important to the company? Um, and perhaps also um, some ideas from, from, from our panelists um, on how you could integrate that and, and make sure that also employees are, are on board further down uh, the line. Um, because I think I saw on the website that this, that this is one, one of the important mottos also of uh, Marlies van Weijen in, in, in organizing the team, making sure that people are stimulated to also be uh, on that same page. Um, so that's a bit of an open question for, um, I don't know who wants to go first. I mean, I'm happy to go on this and say that uh, another downsides of the way in which firms have been presented and the corporation described in the last 50 years is the idea that the create the company is all about the CEO that well, what is happening in micro what happened in Microsoft was the creation of Bill Gates G was the product of Jack Welch and um, um, Apple was all about Steve Jobs Modern business isn't like that. In fact, no business was ever like that. Um, it's a creation of a, a team of people and modern business is even more like that than 20th century business was. So we need to downplay the cult of the CEO and ask, see as, as you were describing, that it's the values embedded in the corporation which actually lead to can the continuity of policies in the long run. Okay, thank you. Any of uh, the other ones who want to hang? I think it's, uh, I think it's wonderfully said, um, fully, fully agree. I think I would add a few, a few, a few points, three points very quick. I think one um, is the purpose of the company. You know, the purpose of the company should obviously serve a number of, of, of CEOs. Uh, I mean, it, it should stick around for, for a bit. And that's very much up to, to supervisory boards um, or shareholders or, or whatsoever to monitor that and make sure that it actually, that it actually lasts. Yeah, so it, it shouldn't be connected to the CEO necessarily. It should be a bit higher up, I, uh, I feel. I think secondly, and I think that's what John is saying, I think as a CEO, you have a responsibility to form a coalition in the company a fabric that converts that purpose somehow into strategy. Now, if you and, and that needs to be a, a, and as a CEO, you can lead that charge, but you you're also part of that fabric and make it as big as possible. Because only if it's in the fabric, it will be very difficult to demolish it when a new CEO comes in. I mean, particularly for large and global companies like like the example like like ours or, I mean, there's so many people. It doesn't. It's not one person for sure. And then I would say third, and that is a bit of a, uh, a personal thing, always make sure that, you know, we talk a lot also today about intents. Yeah, but if you look at the trust of people, the only reason why people start to trust someone if intent goes to behavior, that, that, that you know, that's the only reason, I think. So you need to make sure as a CEO that you every day, you're demonstrating a conversion from intent to behavior. What actions are you taking so that people can actually see what's happening? Those would be my three cents actually to the, to the conversation. Okay, thank you. Dimitri. What we now see is that we are more the compass of a flotilla of smaller ships. And that if the compass says we should north east, that these, you need to find a way for all these, these other people on these smaller ships to go that direction. And that creates a, a, a far different leadership going forward. And that, that is something which I think is also due to the new modern society. 
uh, you have different ways on leading and you need to have the same, share the same purpose, the same passion, because people make their own choices. They even, like Dedrick's point, if you, if you don't like the purpose of Shell, you're certainly not going to work for Shell. You need to be committed to what the company stands for. And then the flotilla mindset works. In compared to the past, where a captain on the big ship said, hey, we go from Northeast. Yeah, you don't have a choice. You're on this big ship. The only thing is you can jump ship, right? Uh, this is a different way on, I think we should run a company. And I think it's a, it's a better way because it's more inclusive in how you're going to build the company for the future. So it's unbelievable. It's five to two, five to three already. Two hours just went by like that. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to sort of give a few, share a few observations I made based on this conversation. And then I ask every participant in the panel uh, to just either add something or maybe not agree with me, or maybe I forgot something important, or you want to share something that we haven't heard yet. That's, that's the challenge. I keep it short. I've got a few. So the first one, I think it's very fair to say we need to change the way we run corporations going forward. Uh, we have to explore new business models, and we could have had a, a whole session just on which new business models have been emerging in the last few years, but that's beyond today. <clears throat> I think we also agree that we need innovation. And yes, the government and the EU and policymakers can help us achieve innovation, but in the end, it needs to be intrinsic motivation to, to innovate. It needs to be at the heart of the people in the company uh, to do that, and it will not be used, uh, be enforced by regulation, which is essentially my third point, regulation versus deregulation, the evergreen on any discussion on companies came up here as well. And it's fun to see first say CEOs say, well, we, we need less regulation, but of course we also need regulation. So there's this tension that you all have, which is also perfectly understandable and that we have to find a sweet spot. Uh, but let's not forget that the second point, the intrinsic motivation is, in my view, way more important. What I found really interesting, it started with Diederik, but actually everyone after that, the enthusiasm that, you, that I see in you as corporations, policymakers, and academics. Um, and I think that is something uh, that is really key. On the other hand, there is a huge selection bias going on here because you are here because you, you like to talk about it and you have ideas about it. Uh, so I'm, I'm more worried about those organizations that are not here, that did not go to the webinar, and that are just doing the old style of business. Um, I think a very important point that was not so clear before I went into this webinar is the final one, which is the social challenge that was raised by um, Diederik Soms. And I think we can talk about this from a lens of, of companies and investors, uh, but essentially the citizens they make this a success or not. And there will be a lot of citizens hit by some of the transformation going on in the next years. And we have to maneuver really carefully to do that. Uh, so with that, I would sort of summarize how I view this, uh, this, this webinar and what we discussed, but I would really like to ask everyone to sort of add a one or two sentence additional uh, observation that they have, or maybe something they want to stand out. So I start with Professor Kay. I think the question you've raised, Rob, of turning concern and enthusiasm into intrinsic motivation is central to how we bring about the changes we want. Okay, thanks. Dirk? Yeah, um, the point on, uh, that you also made about uh, the, what I identified as the biggest challenge of this transition, which is the social one, taking everyone along. And, and we're still puzzling with the role of companies in that. Uh, because uh, at the moment, we, as I said, we're throwing truckloads of money at uh, public money at that challenge uh, and also regulation at that challenge. Uh, and we are ob obviously challenging uh, specific companies, fossil fuel companies most of the time with this, well, for them, not a challenge, but a real threat. But I would like to involve and include the, the larger business community in this. And one of the things that I'm uh, that we are struggling with is the reskilling operation of people. Um, and we need to get a grip on that much better than we do. We talk a lifelong about lifelong learning, but still we haven't mastered it. Uh, and we need to change that. And I know there's a lot of things that are gradually changing within companies, including sustainable 
um, sustainability and things like that. And this one needs to be in there too. And I think, again, this one is more difficult than investing in new technology that is innovative and sustainable. This is investing in people that are not always as willing as you might want to. Uh, and that are always, not always as capable as you might want to wish to. But still, we need to do it. And the government cannot do it alone. So we need to involve the business community in tackling that, because otherwise we're going to run into the wall. Thank you. Alice. Don't forget to unmute. Yeah, actually, um, I want to add two things. Um, uh, it is actually said, but um, uh, several people here said it, we cannot do it alone. And if I am correct, uh, SDG number 17 is uh, working together. Uh, so maybe that goal is the most important one that connects everything we want to, uh, to, uh, uh, um, to, to reach. Um, but the other one I'd like to add is that um, let's let, let sustainability also be fun. Let people see that it is fun to be sustainable. And if, if you do something that you like, you will act like it as well. Okay, thank you. Dimitri? Yeah, Rob, let me close off. I, I've, I've made a note, two words. I think John said it. Um, we need to be intelligent as a company, as governments, as society, uh, but it needs to be collective intelligence to make the Green Deal work. And for me, the Green Deal is, is not an EU or a Brussels or a Diederik Samson thing. It is something which we all are. And we need to do this collectively and we need to do this intelligently. And I've seen a lot of intelligence over the last two, two hours in this call, um, although I don't know whether it's the right reference, but I also see a lot of collectivity in what we've discussed. And I think um, I would end with that because I think that is a, a nice end for a new start. Thanks. So the, the, the real final word is for Hein. <laughs> well, um, no, one thing to add, and that's indeed on the social challenge. I think we're all coming back to that. I, uh, apart from the, the, the grander words of Dimitri, which I ascribe to, a bit of a sobering one, perhaps to end with. Um, for some, pursuing the things we talked about is an obvious business model and can really work. But for others, in society, it is simply more difficult and affordability is an issue. So when we work forward, we need to work together to take everyone with us in, for example, a bigger green deal and make sure that those who can't afford to invest in whatever they need to are somehow taken along. And that's something that concerns me, um, but I'm sure together we'll find a solution. <laughs> It's exactly three o'clock now, and I know all of you have very busy agendas. So let me thank all five speakers in, in one go for participating. I think we had an excellent discussion. When we talk about collective intelligence, it's definitely not just the five of you and the two of, uh, of Maastricht, but it's also the 170 people that started at this uh, session. I wanna thank them for asking the questions and, and being here. And if you want to follow up, maybe with some questions, you can also send an email to uh, Mika Olaz or me uh, and see whether we can get this discussion going. And this discussion will continue because we will organize an in-person event as soon as it is possible in this COVID context. And with that, this session on behalf of Mika and me will be closed. Thank you very much, all of you, and have a really nice weekend. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye.